podcast was a challenge for me. Somebody asked for it. And it, it occurred to me I hadn't ever done one on this subject. And I don't know if it was a conscious decision or, or just kind of an unconscious decision. I think one of the challenges is, and it's the first thing that I want to offer you tonight, it's a great challenge for parents. You know, this, this kind of, it's not an acting out, but it's rather a, a non-action, an inaction. <clears throat> And sometimes it's easier to respond to acting out, right? You can do things to prevent it. You can do things to, to change it. Um, whereas a, a non-action is, is at times harder to deal with. And so I want to start off from a place of empathy and understanding uh, and talk about some ideas, some concepts, some psychology in this. Uh, but, but one of the first, of course, start off with the idea that this is a fantastic challenge. <clears throat> I have some quotes here, but one of the things I've noticed at Evoke that can happen during our program is that children can get, get a zest for learning. They, they read more books than many of them do than they ever have in their life. And, and just learning something can be uh, the beginning of a, of, of a momentum that carries them through. A mind once stretched by a new idea never regains its original dimensions. A few quotes. All who have meditated on the art of governing mankind have been convinced that the fate of empires depends on the education of youth. History is a race between education and catastrophe. A teacher affects eternity. He can never tell where his influence stops. The aim of education is to enable individuals to continue their education. And the object and reward of learning is continued capacity for growth. And then lastly, only people who die very young learn all they really need to know in kindergarten. So there's, there's a value, right, that, that we place on, on education at Evoke. And, and I, I'm going to say that because I'm also going to talk this evening about a balance. I'm going to talk about how at times we, we see that as the entire picture. And, and so part of this is kind of resetting our perspective on it and then paying attention to the long game. Interestingly, the number one most common complaint on an application, right? The reason why parents decide to send their children to a vote. The number one most common one is some kind of problem with education failing out of school, school refusal, getting kicked out. It's kind of the last drop. For many parents, they wouldn't make this decision. They wouldn't take this step if it didn't occur there. And in many cases of the cases that I'm describing, the underlying problems and issues and symptoms occurred long before the, the final break from, from school. But for a lot of people, it becomes such a priority, such a, you know, that there's, a, there's almost a, a lack of balance in it that they can, we can tolerate a lot. There's the justification there in the sense that it is a, a, a very uh, important indicator of somebody's level of functioning, right? It's, it's one of the things that, that is listed in the diagnostic manual, that if you're not functioning in, in your job or in school, then that's a sign, one of the signs, that the problems have, have risen to the, the level of a mental health issue. So there's justification there. And at the same time, we need to understand that, that it's, it's just one sign. It's just one, one piece of evidence. And, and if we learn to, and I'll talk about tonight, to, to listen to it, instead of getting stuck on paying attention to the symptom, if we learn that something's going on underneath it and address that, then, of course, this will, will heal, heal itself. There was a commercial many years ago that, that somebody told me about many years ago. And it was, a, it was a commercial of a father reading a newspaper. You know it was an old commercial because somebody was reading the newspaper. But he's reading the newspaper, and his younger son, his young son, came up and said, I want to play. And the dad kept putting him off, wanting to finish his newspaper reading for the evening. And, and so finally, uh, when the son approached him, he took a picture of the newspaper up, and there was a map of the world on one side. He ripped it up into small pieces. And he gave it to his son. He said, when you put this puzzle together, then I'll stop reading, and, and then I'll play with you. I'll spend some time with you. And the son came back just a couple of moments later, and... The, the boy said, I'm done. And he said, how did you finish so fast? And he said, well, there was a picture of a family on the other side of the newspaper. And this is a little bit cheesy, but there's a picture on the other side of the newspaper. And all I did was put that back together and the whole world fit into place. While that's a kind of a sappy story, um, this is part of, of the message, right? That when we get everything in order, then, then school will work. But if we just think about school as a symptom that we want to fix, then we're going to miss the bigger picture. I was running an intensive this week and one of the, the, the individuals gave a hypothetical example of, of, a, of a school refusal as an example. And it wasn't a chronic issue yet, but it was 
something that was occurring now and again with his teenage son. And as he was describing that, we were kind of modeling boundaries and consequences. You know, one of the natural consequences that we talked about was, well, if, if you're not going to go to school, and part of the complaint was that his son was having a stomach ache and not feeling well. And so part of the natural consequence was, if you're not going to go to school, then, then you're going to have to go to one of two places. You're going to either have to go to a, a physical doctor, right, a, a health doctor, because something's wrong, or you're going to have to go to a psychology doctor, a therapist, in other words. Because it's either a physical problem that you're having, because it's, it's reoccurring quite often. I think he said it was happening about once a week. Or you're going to have to visit with a therapist. And we're going to have to find out what this symptom is a manifestation of. And I'm going to talk about this a little bit tonight, but I want to be clear about somatic symptoms, about somatization. That's the, the term that means that we turn our emotional issues into a physical complaint. There's this idea that people say that it's only in your head. You know, that a somatic complaint, a somatic issue is only in your head. And while that can be true in some cases, emotional distress, anxiety can lead to real physical problems. So it's not an either or, right? Ulcers begin with stress and worry and anxiety and they become very real. There are other health issues, and I'm not a medical doctor, of course, but that, that derive their origin from some kind of disturbance emotionally. Something's going on. So it, it can develop into real symptoms. It's not a faking kind of thing. And I think some people think of it that way. It, it becomes a problem when, like I said, to start out, when we think of it as the entire picture. You know, Some of the symptoms, of course, they're going to get behind. They're going to get off track, and it's going to be difficult, if not impossible, to get back on track. Like I said, diagnostically, it's equivalent to if somebody's not working in their career. If their mental health issues become uh, such an issue that, that they can't perform their job, then it's an issue. Pa parents worry about the work ethic of it, of course. Sometimes it's resistance to, to family and authority, right? It's a, it's a teacher whose child fails out of school. It's the police officer's child that ends up arrested. So sometimes it's a way of differentiating, of rebelling, of creating your own identity in opposition of authority and family. Um, and like I said, it, it's, refusal can be a symptom of something mental or physical, which physical is often a, a mental thing. Um, sometimes it's the origin of it has to do with substance abuse, right? Marijuana, for example, lowers motivation. They become distracted when they're using marijuana. Other drugs can, again, they can, they can get behind, they can be distracted, they can be uninterested, they can be lethargic. Uh, it can affect social issues, right? Self-esteem. There are countless stories uh, of people feeling uh, overwhelmed by the, the in the feeling of insecurity around a learning difference that is undiagnosed. And, and so the longer that that happens, of course, not coming, avoiding can, can be the thing. There can be social issues and bullying issues there. And then, of course, anxiety and depression can affect attendance. A lot of people report it's about anxiety. And then probably the, the one that's maybe the, you know, it might be, might be the common cold is just not having the, the ability to delay gratification and do, deal with frustration tolerance, right? That, that would be with any task, and school would just be the task at hand. So part of what we do, part of what I always talk about is you shift from the symptom to what's it trying to tell us and what's it trying to tell the child. And, and so uh, most of you, if not all of you, have ended up here. And one of the, the factors was your child's inability to be successful or to attend school. And so you end up in a place where really they need a, a, a bigger container, right? A container that can, that can deal with it and you can't deal with it at home. And there's no shame in that. I'll talk about some other resources. Learning differences can cause frustration, self-doubt and confusion. Anger, of course, resentment, sadness, hopelessness, fear, defiance, hurt, shame, depression, loneliness, learned helplessness, like nothing I do can make a difference in my life. Right? Those are all 
kind of sub-symptoms of anxiety and depression in adolescence and young adulthood. So part of it might be testing, finding out what's going on, getting testing at home, getting testing in the wilderness in the case of, of some of the children. Um, I, I wanted to bring up these two. Um, this idea of being too bright or a fear of success, let me pull that apart a little bit. You know, the, the idea of being too bright is, of course, they can be bored. And you're going to have usually some sense if your child is, is, is gifted or intelligent. But, but maybe even more on the side of they have to get it perfect, right? One of the challenges is you have to get the best grade in the class, not just an A. Or if you get an A minus or a B plus. And so that heightened level of anxiety can lead to school refusal. Right? And if my identity is I'm the smart and the gifted kid, then I have nowhere to go but down from that. Some people talk about a fear of success. I don't really believe in a fear of success. I think it can present that way, it can look that way, but fear of success is just a fear of failure. Right? If I achieve this level of accomplishment of success, there's nowhere to go but down. And that's a, that's a tremendously stressful level to maintain. So it's what comes with the fear of success. And what ultimately comes with the fear of success is the failure of failure or being less than perfect or not living up to it. It leads to perfectionism, anxiety, what looks like obsessive compulsive disorder in some ways. I've had clients actually whose parents had to limit the amount of homework that they did, right? And, of course, these can lead to, to dropping out. These can lead to school refusal. I had a teacher that I so admired in high school. And this is right before I dropped out of high school, by the way. Uh, I so admired him in high school, and I was afraid of not impressing him. I was looking for the affirmation of a father figure, and I liked him. And so I acted out in this class, number one. And number two, on one particular test, I got every question wrong on purpose, which included... 15 true or false questions, which takes some, some concentration to get wrong. And, of course, he could see right through it, and he, he called me up after, after the next class, and, and he brought me in, and he said, what's going on? You obviously knew the answers to these questions. And I, I couldn't articulate it. I just kind of gave him some kind of defiant answer, like I didn't care. But really what I was was I was afraid of, of failing. It's not, you know, drugs had a lot to do with it. But, but it was later that year that I dropped out of high school and didn't go back for a couple of years. So sometimes it is the, it's, it's subtle things. And, you know, my mother didn't, didn't know what to do. She was overwhelmed by it. But I had nobody to talk to to explain to work out this issue with. Don't know if I would have done it very easily anyway. But, of course, I, I could have used a therapist at uh, that time. I could have had the... The, the practice, the discipline of a therapist, and worked on it. It's very important, of course. Part of the, the, this idea is that we learn to pay attention to effort more than potential or giftedness, right? Phrases praising children's giftedness doesn't work for them. I love the story by the, the, the CEO of Spanx. She tells the story that at the dinner table growing up, her father would ask all the children, all, all the family members, what did you fail at today? And when they talked about something they failed at, he would toast them, right? He would congratulate them for trying something hard, for, for putting themselves out there. And she said, it got to the point, you can look this story up, you can Google the story. It got to the point where if you didn't fail, <coughs> didn't try it at something and fail at it, she kind of felt left out of it. And she learned from her father at that age to celebrate taking risks and failing. And sometimes our mentality is about accomplishments. We, we overvalue success. <coughs> Excuse me. We overvalue success and we don't learn to value the struggle, see the wisdom, see the goal in failing and struggling and doing well. <clears throat> From the book Nurture Shock, I, I, I pulled this quote. Sure, he's special, but new research suggests that if you tell him that, you'll ruin him. It's a neurobiological fact. So if you want to learn more about that, listen to the, the podcast or webinar on Nurture Shock or, or pick up a copy and, and read in particular the chapter on the inverse power of praise. And then where they suggest that we learn to praise effort, something within the child's control versus outcome.
versus giftedness. So how do we cope with it, right? It, it, it's something that, it, it's, it's a hard thing to lay out this template because the child is invested at it failing. And so I don't have step one, two, and three, and four, that if you follow these steps, your child will get, get going to school. I suppose step one would be take a step back, pay attention to the long game, know that there's something happening there, and start addressing that, <clears throat> what's going on. Get others involved. Get a therapist involved. They can see it more clearly. They're less triggered by it, and your child is a little more likely to respond to them. <clears throat> that can be a family therapist. That can be a child therapist. You know, a lot of times, what, what I often encourage people to do, if there are people in your life that you're in a relationship with that you want in therapy, children especially, spouses, of course, then ask them to come to therapy with you. Say, I need help. And then be open to the fact that part of this is your family therapy, right? And, and, and if the therapist is good, they'll spend time with, different segments of the family, maybe the couple, maybe just you, maybe just your child. But to say to somebody, you need therapy, usually doesn't inspire them to open up to it. Keeping the long game in sight. Again, I'm just one example. It's the only one that I have that's me. But, you know, I had other issues. And I was out of high school for um, two and a half years, uh, two years. About two years. I dropped out midway through my 10th grade year, so that's two and a half years. Um, and then went back when I was 18 and, and got an adult school diploma by taking a few classes. I got a lot of credit for work. I worked really hard, I, I, and I studied, and I, I got into a university, and then I got straight A's and graduated in three and a half years, and then went on to graduate school. And I was a little bit behind in math, never quite, quite cut up. On that, but it wasn't my passion, and I didn't need much of it. I had to get tutors in college to deal with some of the statistics of the research. But the point is this: um, when everything else got right, right, when everything else got right, then then school would just made sense. I was capable of, of doing it. It's the same message in the movie Goodwill Hunting. If you haven't seen Goodwill Hunting, consider this your assignment to see it. Where the main character is an absolute genius. And there are two mentors, two prime, primary mentors in his life. He's played, played by Matt Damon, if you don't know the story. And one was a Harvard professor, right? And focusing on the giftedness, or an MIT professor, focusing on the giftedness of this child. And then Robin Williams was the therapist who was focused on the whole person. Gave examples in, in, a, in a famous scene in the bar of, of describing some profile of somebody who was incredibly gifted in math and engineering. And it was the Unabomber, right? That, that, that terrorist, that, uh, that um, American terrorist um, from several years ago. And then gave another example of the professor himself. It's important that we balance it out and that we, we understand that once you know, I have a client who told, who told me that he tells his son all the time when his son makes goals and plans and has worries for the future, this, this parent says to his son, you know, it only matters if you're sober. I mean, at this point, it's obvious you're an addict. It's obvious. And so none of this will matter unless you get sober. And it won't matter if your kids do well in school. It won't lead them to be happy unless they work out whatever it is they need to work out emotionally, psychologically, or if they have an addiction, whatever it is. So reprioritizing school in the process can be important. And, and if, you, right, if you get to the, to the end of everything that you tried at home, sometimes that's when you need a program out of the home. You may need resources like the ones you've enlisted. Your child may need more, a more resourceful container. And this is not something you can do. Most of you have jobs, have other responsibilities, and you can't be your son's residential treatment staff. Know that you're not alone. Right? This is a common challenge for people. People have these difficulties. It's not about you. It's not a reflection on you necessarily. There might maybe something in it for you to learn. Right? There might be some process for you to explore and uncover. That's what family therapy can do. Like learning the, the, the praise example. Right? 
that's a, that's something I learned as a father when I read Nurture Shock. The pressure, the anxiety that is present in my child might be some function in the family system, and that's important to look at. But it's not about you. It's not a reflection of you. And, and we have to deal with the shame that we feel in our society. We have to deal with, the, I think, what is, what is almost universal, and that is the comparisons to each other. Right? It's that idea that, you know, what, what everybody else's um, outsides, I'm comparing their outsides to my insides. Right? I'm comparing everybody else's highlight reel to my behind the scenes footage. You know, everybody's struggling with something. And part of what I want to, to engender is this self compassion for yourself, for your family, for your struggles. And know that this path that you're on. Um, in my experience, and, and, and I'm biased towards it, is a richer path when there's a struggle. So it, can, it can, requires us to ask different questions, to look at different things, to expand ourselves. So part of it is redefining success, you know, putting things into priority, um, listening to the symptoms, you know, find outside resources, ed consultants, therapists, IOPs with alternative schools in your community. It eventually can rise to the level, of course, of the therapeutic boarding school or treatment program for alternative schools. But again, in all of that, in all of that, prioritize the overall mental health, the overall well-being above school performance. We don't want that to be the thing. It's an indicator. It's an important indicator. But it's not the thing that we're treating. It's the symptom of what we're treating so I, I wish i had steps and i it, you know for me even as a therapist this is best worked out you know if, if any of you who are struggling or have been struggling with this were a client of mine uh, an individual client we would work it out we would problem solve it would it would be a non-judgmental process and it would be a hard process and children stretch us and they require transformation. And we would make, you, you would make, not we, you would make small decisions along the way. And we would try to unpack what it meant and what was going on. And then we would try to treat that most effectively. If it was depression, if it was anxiety, if it was any other the dynamics that I've described, we would try to treat, sort that out in the child. And then school would follow. And then... In some cases, alternative containers. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's not a literal thing, but in this case, it is. Almost alternative containers would be recommended. So a parent says, this is perfect timing for what I'm dealing with in his aftercare place. I'm glad. Glad it's helpful. I'm happy to take any questions. I'll also go to some of the upcoming. Um, let me say a few other things. And I, I, I really would welcome any questions. but um, don't give up on it. You, you know, I, I don't mean, none of you are giving up. You're here because you don't give up. But I mean, what do I mean by that? I mean, it's a long journey and it requires stamina and you're going to feel like giving up. But, but there, again, there's, there's, there's wisdom in the symptom. There's gold there somewhere. There's something to be learned, something it's trying to tell us. Like I say in the behavioral chapter, before trying to change a behavior, we, we would be wise to listen to what the behavior is trying to tell us. Next question. What do you do when your child did the wilderness and now is an aftercare failing school? He holds us to we sent him there. He holds us to we sent him there. You know, again, it's a very, it's not kind of a one answer thing. It's, um, this is this is all, I don't want to cop out on this. I don't want to just just punt on this, but it's a question for what's the plan there? What's the plan at the at the at what what's the therapist doing at, at aftercare? How are they working with them? You know, ultimately, the, the thing that, that's important for you is to to shed that, to not wear that 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 blame, and to say you know what and to have this. It's not it's not this statement I'm about to give you, but it is an attitude that this statement suggests, which is. Maybe I made the wrong thing and you're resentful, but I'm not gonna, you know, I'm not perfect. And maybe I made a mistake. 
it, I'm doing the best that I can and you're allowed to be mad and you're not allowed to not like it. And if your if your resolution is to self sabotage to punish me, I, I guess I don't take that at face value unless it's just pure parental manipulation. Then your your work is to detach from it. And detaching from it doesn't mean talking him out of it or arguing with him or having a power stroke. It means okay. So you're mad that we sent you there. You want to hold us accountable, and the way that you're going to do that is you're going to punish yourself which you think will secondarily punish us by failing or struggling in school. What, I, I can't be held hostage by that, right? I can't be punished into capitulating because that's what you're doing to me, right? You have those, it's, again, I'm not saying you literally say these things, but it's that type of attitude. You don't, you don't give him something to hang it on so that it just falls off of you. And you let him be mad. And you, 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 you make it about him. I, I'm skeptical of, of it being that conscious of a decision. If it's so, if, if, if we take him at face value, it's because you sent him there and he's just resentful or he wants to punish you. If that's just what it is, you can't capitulate, right? I mean, that doesn't make sense. So, so it's a longer discussion, but it's, a, it's an attitude. Um, of what they would call extinction in behavioral theory, which is you don't reinforce it by engaging it, by trying to defend it, by trying to argue with it. You just say, okay. Any suggestions for the brother of one of the kids there currently who refuses to go to therapy? He insists he just hates the school working on a transfer. His brother keeps cutting classes. You know, first of all, you should go anyway, right? Go to family therapy without him for starters, right? Be in therapy. Um, I'm trying to ask myself, would I require a child to come to family therapy? Um, I could see myself trying to do that to, to help me. Like, you have to, this is a family thing that we're doing and I need help. And, and give the, the therapist a window into the dynamic, right? You know, I, I guess if he utterly refuses and he's so oppositional and that's the only place that he's oppositional, you know, go to therapy yourself. You know, I, I run these private intensives and, and um, what I always say to families is you can get a lot out of it by just going yourself. A lot of, a lot of people want to bring the family because they know it's a family dynamic issue. And, and I love doing the family intensives. Do them all the time. And you can get out a, a lot out of it yourself. And I, I, you know, I, I wish there were easy answers to some of these things, but it's a, it's a dialogue that, that is only best had in dialogue with the therapist themselves. So my thought is you go, you go with Adam, you consider requiring it that he has to come as part of the family, give a therapist a window into that. If he, if he, if he rebels against that or resists that and nothing else, Talk to your therapist about it. Talk to about where they're at. And if that's the only area in life where he's rebellion, rebelling, you know, if, that, if that's the only area that he's refusing therapy, then maybe you let that one go. But if this is a symptom of other things, then, then you have broader things to deal with. My son is in aftercare for two months now. Very little progress in school, getting way behind. I don't understand the lack of motivation. Nothing motivates him right now. Nothing motivates him right now. He did better in school prior to going away to wilderness and aftercare. How long do I pay, be patient until he comes around? Um, that's a really good question. Uh, this is this is why this webinar is such a hard one to do because it's not a simple answer. I don't know how long you be patient. I, I mean, again, if he were my client and you were in my program. We would talk about it. We would talk about, okay, what, what's our next step? What are we going to do? And you don't want to, right? You don't want to blow the whole thing up. But I, I, I would, it's hard to answer a specific question about your son. What should you do just based on, you know, the, the, these one or two sentences. Talk to your therapist about the plan. Talk to your therapist. When I say your therapist, I'm talking about the therapist he's working with. Talk to him about the reason. Make sure he has testing. If he didn't get testing with us, get testing now to make sure there's no underlying 
learning learning issues, right? So get him testing. Um, but but come up with a plan. You know, here's the deal. Uh, this is one of my my favorite concepts in supervision with with therapists is it's the therapist's job. My job when I'm a wilderness therapist. My job when I'm at a therapeutic school. It's my job to find the child adequately enough to tell the story of the child that the child isn't able to tell, right? And in this story, a couple of things occur. Number one, everything about what the child is doing makes sense. I tell the story, I tell the child's story in such a way that everything that he or she is doing makes sense. And the second thing that, that so, so all the symptoms, no matter how self-sabotaging it is, right, self-defeating it is, Everything in that makes sense. And I revise that as I, as I learn new information, right? I keep retelling it. I keep re-adjusting re, um, the story the more that I learn, the more experience that I have. But the story does something else besides make everything make sense. The story, um, it asks certain things of parents, of therapists, and of, of, the, of the community that the child is in. And so that's really the, the, the therapist's job. And you know, I, I look for just a, a, a deeper story than he's just oppositional. But th that's the idea. And so that's why I say it's, your it's his therapist's job to tell you the child's story and, and to have this make sense. And what does that ask of us? I know that's a very generic, but that's, that's the whole task, right? I have students that struggle in the program longer than others, right? All the way to the end. And it's important for me to say, okay, this is what this is what I th this is what I'm thinking. This is my hypothesis that I've tested and seems to be accurate and consistent. This is what's going on with him. This is why he's doing it. This is why it makes sense, perfect sense, why he's doing what he's doing. And this is what it asks of you. So that's my thought. I'm worried that uh, only have five months till he's 18. And I need to want, and I need and want him to graduate. He threatens to sign himself out. Not sure how to make him turn. He's been in treatment for 11 months. There's a few things in that one. Okay, a few things in that one. Number one, I want to talk about fear for just a second. I'm going to talk about this next week. But of course you're worried. That's a normal worry to have. And, and that worry can inform you. But worry is part of the problem in parenting, right? Fear is part of the problem in parenting. So that, that's somewhere you, you've got to be in a place where you get that taken care of. Listening to webinars, reading books, going to therapy, going to Al-Anon. You have to manage your fear because if it drives you, if it is the driving force, not the informing force, but the driving force, it's never going to go well. You're going to get into power struggle. You're going to want to control things. So um, that's an important project for you to work on. That's what Al-Anon and support groups are for, is to work on that. Um, Remember that, that 18 years old is, first of all, when, when children threaten that they're going to sign themselves out at 18, my response is, okay. Most of them threaten it. Most of them don't do it. They're kind of testing you. But, but again, you can't be held captive, right? You can't be held hostage by the threat. And my response would be, okay. And, and, and if you believe he still needs treatment until he's 18, the response is, I'm going to get as many seeds planted as I can before 18, and then he has that choice. I can't stop him legally. He's able to do that. that that's what you can do. And then you can set boundaries after that. If, if, if that's what you feel like is the right thing for you to do in the process, if that's your truth. But the, the threat of, of walking away, the threat of signing himself out, it's noise. I don't, I don't believe a child when he threatens. I don't believe a child when he promises he's going to do everything right. You know, when a child says, I'm going to go home, I'm never going to talk to my parents again, and my response is, okay, how do you know? And when a child says, I'm never going to do drugs again, and I'm going to do everything my parents ask, my response is, you don't know that either, right? I just don't believe them. It doesn't matter what they promise and what they threaten. It matters what they're doing day to day. And it matters what your truth is. Like, is your tr I can't support that. And that's where it comes from, right? This is what I can Based on my truth, this is what I'm willing to support, not support. And so to speak from that 
grounded place. That's why you have to manage your fear and anxiety because your children do things that would make any parent anxious and worried. So then it becomes most imperative that you take care of your fear and anxiety somewhere else so that you can come in, in your most capable and grounded way. Are there ways to encourage your child without being teachy-preachy? Um, yeah, I'm anti-teachy-preachy for sure. You know, I, I think modeling mental health is the best thing that we can do. Modeling boundaries is the best thing we can do. Modeling self-care is the best thing we can do. You know, I talk about in the, my book, The Unlived Life of a Parent is one of the greatest wounds that a child carries around. So take care of yourself, including your boundaries. Like, this is what I'm willing to support and not willing to support in this process. That's really, really critical. Um, so I, I think that the way you do it is with your boundaries. Teaching and preaching. There's a webinar. You know, my book talks about this fundamentally, is that boundaries... Are, are, are what teach children. And the teachy preachy stuff is what is controlling children. So the webinar on control versus influence or the chapter in my book on control versus influence, um, the webinar on the three circles or there's a blog on the three circles, boundaries in the three circles. You know, when I try to get somebody to change, parents do this all the time. So I don't have to set a boundary. That's controlling, right? Harriet Lerner in her book Dance of Anger talks about this, that anger and resentment is only, is only a useful tool if I get more clear about myself, not about other people. And that my job is to get clear about myself. My job is to set boundaries. But really saying, you can do what you want. Just, these are just my consequences. These are just my rules. These are my boundaries. This is what happens if you do. This is what happens if you don't. You're not passive, but you're not controlling. You're assertive and clear. So there's a whole bunch in that question. I love your question because there's a whole bunch in it about what does it mean to impact a child? The best answer that I have is my book. Because it's I talk about this kind of borrowing from Harriet Lerner's book, The Dance of Anger, that, that lecturing, debating, begging, pleading, guilting, shaming, intimidating, right? Sharing your feelings with your children so they're responsible for making them better. All of those things. All of those things are excuses for boundary. A boundary is a boundary. You can do what you want. And again, it's not that you use this language, but this is the attitude. You can do what you want, but here's my boundary. If you yell at me, if you quit school, if you do drugs, right? Lastly, I'll give this as an example because it's, it's a shift about, I'm saying boundaries are, are what do it. And I would reduce the amount of teaching and preaching. I, I have what's called the grocery store lecture or uh, the yard work lecture where it's one or two sentences, right? I take my son grocery shopping. This is a real story. And I, I give him one sentence. And I say, Jake, I found empty beer in your room, and it's not okay. And if it happens again, here's the consequences. And then I say, will you go get me some milk over in the dairy section? And that's it. Right? And most important, the most important ingredient in improving all of this is connection. And connection requires listening and capacity on your part. It requires paying attention to the long game, not worrying about 18. That's not the goal. Not worrying about my example that I share. I, I in essence, didn't graduate from high school. And, and yet I got straight A's throughout undergrad and grad school with, with a ninth grade education. And not everybody's me, not everybody can do it. But again, it's back to once I got right, once I got myself okay, I could do what I needed to do in life. And so let's let's work on getting somebody right first. I have lots and lots and lots and lots of examples personally in my life, friends, acquaintances, colleagues, and clients who took a non-traditional route to find themselves school, academically, and career-wise. Right? I didn't start college until I was 21, for example. So... What, is, uh, what has been your experience with school engagement and aftercare? What is the parent's role in maintaining motivation? Mostly, you, you know, you're there to back the program and the therapist. Let them do the heavy lifting. That's my experience. Let them do the heavy lifting. My experience is it's mixed. They're better at, at reinforcing, you know, school is a part of the curriculum. It's part of, excuse me, 
course, it's part of the curriculum. School is a part of the treatment plan in, in, in aftercare, right? So it's not just about if you can share your feelings. It's, it's doing your job. And if you're not doing your job, we got to address that. Not, not just simply behaviorally. That can be a part of it. But we also got to address it in terms of therapy, like what's going on. So it's not, it's, it's a part of a well-rounded self. I am a, a huge, I believe, like some of the quotes that I shared, I believe education is the most important thing in, in the world that will make a difference. I believe it would have the biggest impact on, on wars, on violence, and not just education, you know, mathematics, but a liberal arts education. Obviously, you know, philosophy would make a difference. History would make a difference, right? Psychology, of course, would make a difference. So I'm, I can't, when I think about what would be the biggest, if everybody in the world had a basic college education, if they were capable of it, had a basic college education, would there be a difference in the world? I believe there would be a fantastic world. So I believe in it. It's important. Not everything. And, and there's a lot of, of what we have to do with parents a lot of time where shifting their perspective to, to reprioritize what's going on with them. And again, get them to, the, to look at the long game and not the short game in part of the process. And that's, I can't speak to every one of you individually, but that's a common task that when I'm working with a, fa a family, a case, a situation, that's, that's what I'm doing a lot of my work with them around. Where's the line between being understanding, not pushing, and not having them live up to potential? Um, it's not an either or. You can be compassionate. It's, it's about whether it comes from a place of fear, anxiety, control, anger, versus this is what I'm okay with. Remember this. People that go to Al-Anon, right? people go to, go to Codependence Anonymous, they're not passive. They don't get pushed around. They're not pushovers. You don't walk all over them. They're more assertive, more honest, more clear, more active. In my webinar on control versus influence, I talk about this, that most permissive parents are controlling because they do emotional coercion, threatening, shaming, guilting, blaming, fighting, arguing, all that stuff. Most permissive parents are controlling. So the dichotomy that you've created is a little bit different than what I just said, but is, is you are understanding, right? You, you treat it like it's a mental health issue. You don't treat it like it's good and bad or, or, or you know, you don't talk about it being willful even sometimes. You have compassion and patience. But you have boundaries. You have consequences. You have limits, right? And you do it from a place of clarity, not from a place of fear or anger. That's the difference. So my answer to your question Where's the line? That's the important question, right? That's what therapy, parenting therapy is about finding your truth and then expressing it assertively without fear, without fear of outcomes, without trying to manage outcomes, right? Without not coming from a place of fear or control. And I'll talk about that in the next webinar at length. It's about where you're coming from. But if you're coming from a place of this is what I feel good about. This is what I'm willing to support. This is what I'm not willing to support. Anywhere from how much TV they watch to how much computer time they have to, to, to where they go, how, what their curfew is, right? All of that is more of a question about what are you comfortable with and, and exploring where that truth comes from. So, so that's, that's my answer. It's a process for sure. What if your therapist does not have a plan? He states that therapy is soft. I want a plan with some sort of guidelines. And they just say, you need to keep moving along. Well, I, I don't know how to respond to that because what's the moving along? The moving along is a plan. I mean, you have a plan. And if there's feedback that he has for you, give it specifically and clearly. If he says that you're micromanaging, talk about that. It's okay. I wouldn't be defensive about that. I would just say, what, what is this feedback? Um, I don't know what therapy is soft means. Um, and the fact that you want to plan, are you being over controlling? Are you being too anxious? Are you not, ask him if there's feedback in that statement for you about your position and how does that feedback potentially relate to the dy dynamic with your child. But it's our job to have a model that we're working from. 
right? And if my model is we're just going to keep moving along, that fit that that fits into a, a bigger picture. That's a puzzle piece. What's he mean by that? What I would be, I could be totally wrong. But one idea I'd be skeptical of is that he's trying to give you feedback and telling you to back off. And then I want to hear about that. I want to hear more about that. Like, tell me. And, and I may try it on for size. And I may not. I may challenge it. I'll be open to it. I'll talk to my people, right, about it. My own therapist about it. Um, so, yeah. That's not our, our job isn't to not have a plan. In fact, in Utah, I think it's in most of these, you actually have to have a treatment plan. You have to have a diagnosis. And you have to have a treatment plan if your son is in a therapeutic program. If you're just seeing an outpatient therapist, I want to know what those words mean because in and of themselves, they're meaningless. I want to understand. I think you can push a little bit more. And if you need an advocate for you, find an advocate. I think, see, I think parents and children have the right to ask, to ask difficult questions. And it's my responsibility to give them adequate answers to address their concerns, to help them in understanding the answers to those questions. And so the way you, and I know you just put it in a few sentences, the way you've, it, it, it sounds like he's putting you up being disrespectful, sounds like there might be more to it, sounds like it's a coded message perhaps, but, but treatment planning, even when I see people in outpatient therapy individually, I have an overall picture. I have an idea. I know what my model is. I know why I'm doing what I'm doing. So that's my thought. I'm a, I'm a little bit frustrated for you. Let me put it that way. All right, folks. Thank you for all the questions. These are 12-step support groups. We want all families to go to six. We ask you to try six. Alan on Coder, Families Anonymous. Go to the websites, Google them, and you can find meetings in your area. You can also go to NAMI.org and get free resources and classes in your area. Some families swear by NAMI also, but we ask you to go to the six 12-step meetings. They're free, and there aren't a lot of free things in the field of therapy. Uh, uh, follow us on social media. You can also listen to all of these broadcasts uh, as podcasts on, on Apple devices. Go to the podcast app and search Evoke Therapy Programs. On Android devices, down, download the SoundCloud app and search Evoke Therapy Programs and subscribe there. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram. On Facebook, search Evoke Therapy Programs. You can also find the Second Nature Alumni Foundation on Facebook, which is an organization, an organization excuse me, set up by families to help people that can't afford therapy. And then also uh, you can go to our blog to find new articles produced every week. My book, The Journey of the Heroic Parent, is available on Amazon under, alternative, under other buying options right now. And the, the Amazon warehouse will be restocked soon. Um, upcoming workshops, we ask all families to come to at least one of these if they can. If you possibly can, you can also combine it with a, with a visit to see your child. The next one is coming right up November 18th and 19th. So if you can go and you haven't gone, we do this about every five or six weeks. And so if, if, you're, you know, if you're a few weeks in, you might not get a chance to go again. So if you, if you possibly can go, even if only one of you can come, Contact Gail at evoketherapy.com for more information. We have some tentative dates for the next therapeutic retreat. These are deeper work, personal work, mindfulness, working on yourself. They're really healing. It's really hard for people to come because it's, it's a step into the unknown. But my experience is, and was again this last weekend, that leaving is, is, becomes just as hard because it's just a safe place. So the tentative dates that we have for the next Finding You are January 11th to 14th. 8th through 11th, March, February 8th through 11th, March 15th through 18th, April 19th through 22nd. Um, in, in addition, if you want to do a private family intensive with me, you can contact, contact intensives at evoketherapy.com um, and talk to them there. I'll be in Chicago this Thursday evening, 6.30 to 8.30 at the Renaissance Chicago in, in, on the North Shore in uh, Northbrook, Illinois. Southern California, Sunday, November 26th. Please RSVP to that. It's one that, that happens at somebody's residence on a, uh, on a Sunday that we schedule specifically for so, so that people can come when there's not traffic. So please RSVP to the Southern California one especially. 
four to five pot, potluck followed by a five to 7 p.m. meeting. And then in New York, uh, I'll be there on December 7th, seven to 9 p.m. Um, and that'll be at uh, the City University of New York, 365 Fifth Avenue, seven to nine. You can email andrea at for more questions or to RSVP. Pursuits trips are our adventure trips for families who are young and old. Think sober fun and therapy light. So I was asked to do this today. I'm going to do this next week when I do, my, or this Sunday when I do my webinar. This Sunday, a special time, 2 p.m. Mountain Time, I'm going to do a webinar on lessons from Star Wars, contrasting Dark Vader and Yoda, talking about fear, anger, control, and love, and then the, the whole metaphor that it is. It's something I, I talk about, so I'm going to expand on it a lot deeper. I'm going to write a blog also about it afterwards. So hope you can join us for that. You can also, of course, watch any of these on the archives. Uh, and, and you can also listen to them on the podcast. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for your questions and your investment. Thanks for showing up. I know this is hard work, and, and I know it also that it, that it pays off. And I also know that you're not alone. You are not alone in this process. We are here with you. I'm here with you. So thanks for joining us. I hope this is a helpful point of contact. Have a great evening. I'll talk to you this weekend. Take care. Bye-bye.